Today, we welcome to Global Citizenship Education interview series, Elisa Guerra. Elisa Guerra was named Best Educator in Latin America by the Inter-American Development Bank in 2015 and was a finalist for the Global Teacher Prize in 2015 and 2016. She's a member of UNESCO's International Commission for the Futures of Education, and she holds a Master's of Education degree from Harvard University. After teaching her own children at home, she founded Colegio Valle de Philadelphia, a network of schools in her native Mexico and across Latin America. Elisa is also an international speaker and author. She has lectured in English and Spanish in 21 countries around the world and has published more than 25 books and textbooks. Formerly an early childhood educator, she now teaches creative writing and literature in grades 4th to ninth. Her work was featured in a 2017 Al Jazeera documentary entitled Mexico, the Power of Early Education. So Liz, it's a pleasure to have you here with us at Global Citizenship Education Interview Series. Thank you for joining. Emiliano, it's such a pleasure to be here with you and your audience. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So all my guests here uh, would go through a first, uh, I would say, straightforward question. And the question is, what is global citizenship education? Okay. Um, well, global citizen education for me is the set of uh, intentional activities that are carried out with the goal of helping everyone within a learning community to become capable and uh, respectful human beings. Um, in that sense, and according to many other uh, definitions of global citizen citizenship going around, um, global citizenship education uh, must bring about three equally important aspects, which are knowledge, uh, skills, but also action. It's not enough to just know things and know how to do things without doing those things. Right, right. And it's usually aimed mostly uh, towards the students but also incorporates teachers, parents, and um, everyone. I, I would like to stress here that I don't envision global citizenship education as a separate curriculum, you know, as mm. yet another subject that we need to cover, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. science or, or math. Um, there are, of course, topics to, to be discussed, um, but uh, that can be done from many different angles, including the regular curriculum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see it very much as an holistic approach uh, to the whole institution, whether it is a school or university. So it's some sort of a permeates uh, pedagogy itself and curriculum itself. Yes, it's it's something that we need to teach, but also it's a way of teaching things. Mm, 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 mm. And perhaps even a way of life, because you stressed uh, action, uh, which is a very important element uh, of global citizenship education. Um, I'd like to um, now tie this first question to the excellent work you've been doing with the uh, Valida Philadelphia Schools and perhaps bring in some of your practical experiences um, connecting to students and teaching global citizenship education. If there are a couple of experiences that you particularly find significant um, for our audience, that would be great. Um, well, I think that what most people think about global citizenship, especially if they are not educators, uh, but even among educators, when you think about global citizenship, maybe the first thing that comes into mind is learning about the world, learning about different countries and cultures. And of course, that's that's the door. That's a starting point. Yeah. And uh, that's where I also started with uh, with my schools and, and with my curriculum. When I when I founded this little school, um, I did not have global citizenship in mind. The concept, I don't think that I ever heard of that concept before when I was uh, creating this little school. My aim was to develop my students to their fullest potential. And I thought that 
regular schools were not doing uh, that job. They were, of course, beautiful places. The teachers were caring and capable. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I thought, yes, I thought that what we were teaching in, in those schools could not could not help students reach the the, the fullest potentially. It it was you know too short of uh, um, in its goals. What so, was lacking in your opinion? Perhaps discussions on ethical values, um, an extreme focus on knowledge and skills, but very much less on uh, holistic uh, type of approach to education. What was missing? I think that it, that would be interesting to be discussed in this um, conversation. Well, my my first look at school was from the viewpoint of a mother. I I was mm, not a mm. teacher. I I did not have any training as a teacher. So those concepts that you are saying right now were kind of foreign for me. Mm. Uh, at that point, I was thinking mostly in um, uh, preschool, which was the age of of my kids at that time. Yeah, it was mostly you know um, a structured playground. Mm. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that kids could learn more than just, um, drawing little circles and lines in preparation for writing, which was mostly what, what the kids did here. And I am of course talking about many years ago when my kids were little, they are all adults right now. Mm -hmm. And, and I wanted them to, to love to read, but also to love art and music, and yes, to get to know about different cultures. I, I loved to travel. Um, and, and you know, Emiliano, in my in my country, in my city, Aguascalientes, which is in the belly button of Mexico, mm. uh, still to these days, our schools are very homogeneous. Everybody looks like you, uh, which is of course, you could say a good thing, but also there's not, there's no diversity in, in our schools. So when you find someone that doesn't look like you, that doesn't think mm -hmm. like you, it's a shocking, it could be a shocking experience. Yeah, and I thought yeah. that was also locking, locking in, in our schools. I've been to schools where you get into a classroom and the teacher says, we have 14 different nationalities here. That's not the point. Or at least uh, 20 years ago, that was not uh, how it was in in my school so that was the first part yeah the global citizenship aspect came later and i think it was very natural a, a very natural evolution mm -hmm. and, and of course we learned about the world i um created a, a a curriculum you know to to explore a different country and culture every every month um eventually uh at, at the beginning I just uh, photocopied uh, those little activities that I created myself. Eventually, that came to a series of books. Uh, I have here the one for four-year-olds, but it goes up to 12-year-olds. Uh, so you can see, for example, this is uh, for United States. Right, and, right. Uh, and and uh, here, another one in Canada. Um, and of course, there are many different activities. Israel um uh Kenya and you know the more the merrier and also as as different and far away from each other as as possible so that was just the starting point yeah right yeah now in this in this moment we're doing many many more things um uh languages for example I think that also learning different languages not just one foreign language but at least two uh, being able to to be a public speaker to to present your ideas in an organized and argumented way uh so our our kids learn to to present ted like lectures uh also to to become a, a media creators content creators mm. with with good content one of my students for example she did a documentary on on migration now, in Mexico, uh, the phenomena is that mostly we send migrants out uh, to the United States. Right, right. 
but we also get incoming uh, migration. And, and there was a time in our history when, when the Spanish Civil War, for example, that, that we gave refuge to, to many children. So my student tracked one of those children that was now a grown man uh, in, in his 70s or 80s uh, and interviewed him. Uh, uh, so there was also incoming migration. So it's it's these the two sides of of the coin, you know. Mm, mm. Um, so more or less, I I don't want to take too long to to discuss yes, this. I can see it very much as an integration of um, learning about cultural differences, history, history from from perhaps even a decolonial perspective, um, and then uh, a mix of knowledge and values and action, as you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation. And I believe uh, this ties nicely with my third question related to the Philadelphia methods. Um, can you expand on this? This is quite interesting. Um, it emphasizes the importance of providing a rich and stimulating learning environment. Um, so this is the aim of the Philadelphia methods. Uh, but can you expand on this uh, and perhaps try to connect this to our discussion on global citizenship education? Okay. So when I started out my school, so I was just a mother, as, as, as I said. Uh, later on, I completed my education as a preschool teacher and eventually got a couple of masters. Uh, but starting out, I was only a mother. And um, I, I wanted to do it right, to educate my children. Mm. I have no information on how to do it. So I, I, I went to books. Mm. And among the many, many, many books that I read about um, raising uh, children and education, I found one called How to Teach Your Baby to Read. Mm. Now, the title is intriguing. Mm -hmm. I said, really? A mm. baby? What do you mean with the baby? I mean, it must mm. not be a baby baby in all the sense. But upon going through the book, I saw that, yes, it, it was meant to teach babies, babies. I mean, mm -hmm. one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds to read. Um, so I, I bought the book. I read the book uh, in three days. And everything in the book just was calling my name. You know, I, everything felt very natural and very easy and very straightforward and something that will be joyous for me and my child to explore together. So and as an experiment, I, I, I started doing that. And, and uh, well, my kids were able to read by the age of four. Um, and it's not something that they hated or that it was difficult. It was a, a very natural and joyous process. And, and can you, you know, can you just uh, sorry offer a couple of exam practical examples uh, as you learn them from from the uh, this book, and then transfer to your to your kids? Sure. Um, so the usual way that children learn to read is one at school when they are six, more or less. Yeah. And uh, second, the methodologies, which can vary, but mostly um, in, in my country, in Mexico, uh, in Spanish-speaking countries, um, we, we have a phonics approach. So the kids learn the letters and the sounds that relate mm. to those letters and begin to make words like a jizo, you know. Um, the problem with that is that you rub all the significance uh, that language has for children. It's not significant for them. Yeah, it's fragmented, and and you know it feels boring. It feels like exercises. What is an A? What what is an E? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't have any meaning for for children. So um, the proposal was to teach the children whole words. And, and you could say, well, that's not new. That's the global, uh, the whole language concept. Also mm -hmm. in fashion in the U.S., uh, still in the reading wars, you know, we go from one to another. But yeah. But the difference is that there is explicit teaching of the words. It's not like you find the words in a book and you try to guess the words by looking at the images, at the mm -hmm. illustrations. Here you have the isolated word in large cardboard, in red letters, 
presented with the uh, uh, intensity, duration, and frequency to, to the children in very short sessions throughout the day. Um, very quickly, I, I, I wish I had some, some words here. I mean, mm -hmm. I do have one set of words in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, no, perhaps we can include a link for our audience so someone can actually buy the book and, and uh, have an experience on that. As it, it seems that that was very useful to you. It, it was life changing mm -hmm. for me. Right now, I am sitting in the grounds of the campus of the institutes in Philadelphia that Glenn Doman founded. Mm -hmm. And now I work as a volunteer uh, to help families with brain injured children. But anyway, that's that's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in, a, in a very easy fashion, my, my children learned to read. They loved it. I loved it. We were so happy. And you know, it's known now that there is a, a global learning crisis and that reading is at the center of this global learning crisis. In countries like my country, like Mexico, with middle and low income countries, before the pandemic, one in every two students, 10 year old students could not understand anything that they read. I mean, they had, they were able to, to sound out words, but if you do not understand what you're reading, then what's the point? You cannot right. call yourself a reader, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I I took that that we were doing with uh, that I was doing with my with my kids, and integrated that into school. Now the problem was that it, this was not an approach created for schools. It was an approach created for parents teaching their own children in their living room at home. So of course I had to do some adaptations during you know the, the years uh, uh, and also incorporating other things like global citizenship into into the equation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I called it the Philadelphia method. It it was first devised by Glenn Doman, as I said, uh, and some people call it the Doman method. He hated uh, that word. He said it was mm -hmm. not his method. It was as the method of uh, all the children, brain injured or not, and their families that right. were uh, engaged in this adventure with them. But anyway, I, I call it Philadelphia because uh, they were very known, like the institutes in Philadelphia, those people in Philadelphia, those educators in Philadelphia. Mm. Uh, and, and that's why we call it Philadelphia, as a distinction of the difference between uh, teaching at school or teaching at home. Philadelphia is for teaching at school. Right, right. And how would you summarize in two or three uh, core objectives the 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 core uh, of what the Philadelphia Methods wants to achieve in terms of pedagogy? Wants what the, what the method uh, uh, wants to achieve in terms of transferring knowledge and values to students? What are two or three main goals? Okay, we want to give students as much uh, opportunities and stimulation as possible for them to develop to their fullest potential, which is enormous. Uh, every child has the seed of genius within. And uh, we educators and parents have the immense privilege and responsibility of providing a nurturing environment for this seed to be able to grow and bring about to, to be fruitful. Yeah. Um, and also we want kids to love learning and to be able to keep learning for the rest of their lives. So they 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 need to become the owners of, of their learning to develop the skills that allow them to be lifelong learners. Absolutely. Uh, and, and of course, take away this idea that learning is a task, is an obligation, is something that you have to do. It's your only work. My parents used to tell me when I was a little girl, mm -hmm. <laughs> your only job is to go to school and learn. That's not a job. I mean, learning is the greatest adventure yeah, there is. Yeah. And we should see it always like that. Absolutely. So we discussed uh, the Bala, the Philadelphia schools. We discussed a little bit the Philadelphia method. Now, um, we are heading toward the end of the conversation, but there are a couple of important questions. Um, the first question is, how does global citizenship education uh, 
uh, the work you've been doing with the Philadelphia Method and the Valley of the Philadelphia Schools align with your work uh, on UNESCO's International Commissions on the Futures of Education? Okay, um, I'm very glad that you um, brought that uh, question to the table. Um, the work that we did at the International Commission for the Futures of Education, our mission uh, was to create a global education report that could inform member states on the, how we could transform education towards 2050. Yeah. So in that regards, of course, there's a lot of, of discussion that we needed to, to do, and you can look at education from very different angles. Um, it, it, we spent two years working on, on this report, and I have it here with me. I wanted to show it to you. I have the Spanish version, mm. but of course, mm. it's in many languages, and it can be downloaded from UNESCO's The Future of yeah. Education. We will include website. a link, yes, in the, in the once the... Uh, okay. Your video interview is published. Excellent. Yes. Okay. So um, we spoke about curriculum, of course, about what we needed to learn and mm. what we needed to unlearn. Um, and and yes, we said it's important that children and youth acquire knowledge, but they also need to co-create knowledge, as I was saying before when we were talking about their schools, mm. because knowledge is never complete. Um, and we believe that our curriculums are not maybe uh, addressing all the needs that, that we have in, in this ever-changing and complex and uncertain world. Um, yes, we thought about foundational skills, of course, because of this learning crisis that we had even before the pandemic. Uh, but also we need to think how to live and heal and learn in a damaged planet, how to care for each other, how to care for ourselves physically and emotionally. Uh, plurilingualism, as I was saying before, yeah. strengthening the humanities, scientific literacy, mm -hmm. so important in these days of misinformation. Digital skills, of course, mm. uh, the arts, active and global citizenship, democratic participation, this is such a long list, yeah, <laughs> Emiliano. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. to us for teachers, right? Uh, but how how we propose to do this in the report? Uh, we propose pedagogies of cooperation and solidarity. Just just by the name, you know, it's rooted mm. into global citizenship. Absolutely. So how are they? They are deeply rooted in human rights. Uh, they are abiding by principles of um, non discrimination. They are problem posing. They are participatory. They are not opposed. They are not passive or individualistic. Uh, it's something very important here is that um, we must recognize in our pedagogies that our futures are inter interdependent, and there are also a, a, a variety of futures. That that's why we say futures in the plural. Yeah, there's not just a single outcome yeah. that we are expecting for everyone. No? Absolutely. Uh, and so uh, these pedagogies must be interdisciplinary, intergenerational, intercultural. Uh, that's pretty much uh, the, the way that, that we see it. Now, this is not a recipe and this is not a manual. It's, it's mostly inspiration and key point ideas to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. We propose that we ask ourselves three questions. What we need to keep doing, what we are doing right, what we need to stop doing, what we need to discard, and what do we need to reinvent creatively to, to refresh uh, uh, somehow to, to serve our needs of today. And what is the answer or a couple of possible answers to this third question? What uh, we, do we need to reinvent or uh, any concept that particularly resonated with you? Well, of course, we were 17 different people on the table and uh, all of us had uh, different things that were close to our own hearts. Yeah. For me, it's first reading, the reading crisis, as we discussed mm. already, how and when we teach our students to read. I, I believe that our school systems have been eh, more or less efficient in um 
not not in creating readers, maybe in teaching to read, in teaching to uh, uh, send out words, but we are not really creating readers. So we need mm. to reimagine that. It's not that we have to throw everything out. Uh, uh, we could keep, of course, uh, some things, but I think that that's one of the things that we need to 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 refresh. Um, also, I would like to see much more interest in early development and the importance of parents as uh, the first and most influential educators of their own children. Yeah. And of course, this is tied to my own story. I I began this road in education as a mother. Mm. Uh, so that's very close to my heart. But of course, I mean, we could speak for days here. Uh, the, the report has five... Uh, different um, uh, things to consider one is schools another one is teachers another one mm -hmm. is uh, pedagogies uh, how to teach another one is curriculums uh, uh, what to teach how to teach and uh, and the fifth one will be international collaboration and lifelong mm -hmm. learning Absolutely, absolutely. And so before uh, asking you the last question, which be prepared is a challenging one, I want to ask you a quick question. Uh, do you think there is a crisis of values uh, in general in agri education, education more in general, ethical values, uh, with an extreme focus on uh, uh, preparing students for the international job market, but very much uh, less focused on on teaching values, ethical values. You know what? Yes, I I do believe that, and uh, I was lucky enough. I was fortunate enough last year to participate in a program uh, on character education, mm. and it was with the John Templeton Foundation in the UK, with the Barkey Foundation in in Latin America. So um, there were. 20 teachers doing different projects on character mm. education because yes uh, there there is a lacking on 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 this topic that is uh, so important uh and uh, just to summarize this uh, to sum this up i i remember when i was doing my research for this for this project and and um for what I was doing and I was presenting, which was a creative writing podcast with my students, a quote by uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, which says, um, intelligence is not enough. Intelligent mm. plus character, that's the goal of education. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. There is... Uh a lack of um, uh, focus on developing the personality that the, the, perhaps e even the inner dimension of our students, if you will. And uh, this is, of course, very interesting. I want to ask you a, a last uh, question. Uh, and uh, as I say, it is a challenging one. And the question is, uh, how would you define global citizenship education using just three keywords and why the three keywords? <laughs> Emiliano, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I am going to be a cheater. Okay. I am going to use four words. Sure. Okay? It's fine. It's for the common good. So you're allowed to... to... <laughs> To so just have one more word, maybe, maybe <laughs> even two. Well, if I have one more word, I will say highly capable, profoundly human. Mm, highly capable, profoundly, profoundly human. Very interesting. Human. And if I have one more word, I will just add becoming. Becoming. becoming mm -hmm. Highly capable, profoundly human. Mm, why this, um, uh, let's say... A joint uh, group of uh, very interesting and, of course, important words. What is the main reason? Um, for me, that's the goal of education, not just global citizenship education, mm. but of education as, as a whole uh, to enable individuals, but also communities uh, to develop to their fullest potential, to be highly capable, to be able to, to do things, to know things and do things. 
but at the same time, profoundly human. And this is what we were just discussing, the, the part of character and ethics and, and value. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if, if we think about this, I don't know if it's a definition, maybe it's just an idea. Um, in this idea, we are encompassing cognitive, socio-emotional and action-oriented aspects of uh, global citizenship. Mm-hmm. And uh, and if I can stretch this a little bit, I I will even propose an analogy of of a global citizen. I love trees, and of course, uh, I, I forgot to mention. I just remember right now that I wanted to mention this uh, storybook that I um, wrote. I co-authored with uh, Fernando Reimers, who is a Harvard professor, and I, I I like to think of him, and I I I think I am not mistaken. He's one of the leading experts in global citizenship in comparative yes. education yes. In the world. So we we wrote this book. This is a series of six stories. Very interesting. Uh, where the for for children in elementary school mostly, but it's it's pretty much for uh, all ages. These are six different stories in which the the characters are trees, are are six different trees. So humans are not at the center, you know, of of, of the story. There's not this anthropocentric uh, vision, and um, and we like to think of this book uh, as conversations that can be done between after reading the the stories, uh, opens up the the door for conversations with teachers and with parents. And we even uh, designed some learning activities towards global c- global citizenship uh, from, from the book. So we encompass the whole community. But also trees for me are, uh, trees and forests are, are good metaphors for uh, global citizenships as individuals and as communities. Just to say so uh, the trees are deeply root, uh, they are grounded uh, and that's our culture, our values. But at the same time, their, their, their arms, their branches extend to the sky. So they oxygenate not only themselves, but also uh, they benefit other creatures Absolutely. around us. Just as we humans and communities strive when we open our arms and our minds to the others. Um, I think that's, that's uh, a wonderful metaphor. I, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very interesting conversation. I want to thank you, Lisa, for joining Global Citizenship Education Interview Series. Uh, we touched on very, very interesting areas, starting from the Valley de Philadelphia Schools, the Philadelphia Methods, your work with the UNESCO's International Commission on the Futures of Education, and of course, your take on uh, the core aspects of global citizenship education and education more in general. Thank you so much. Emiliano, it was a pleasure uh, being with you. Thank you. Thank you for your kindness.